I think we should be online now. Okay, we're just checking the live stream again. live yeah okay um, okay hello everyone and welcome to the second set of event that we are doing in the game echo on the occasion of the Athen Biennale. Um, so this is kind of the online part of the installation that you can see at the Biennale that is called Reverse Synergy. Um, just a quick sum up of what we're doing here. So we're having like a, a game. Um, we're having a game, um, a multiplayer uh, game. Uh, called Echo, and we have a set of we have invited a set of people to come be with us in that game for the duration of the exhibition of the Aten Biennale, and we also um, have invited uh, uh, speakers to talk about uh, sort of reflect from their particular angle of research on the on the game uh, Echo. Um, um, so this event is the second event with. Uh, uh, where we invited um, uh, people to, to talk about uh, about the game. Um, so just, um, yeah, so uh, we have today, we will have uh, um, uh, Dorota Gaveka and Egle uh, Kubuk-Kaite, uh, and then we have also after that Wasim Al-Sindi, uh, then Angela uh, Chan and uh, we will finish with Alison Sperling. Um, I will just give uh, a quick uh, intro on uh, all of the speakers just to give you a little bit more context on the angle of their research and their work. Um, so Dorota Gaveda and Egle Kilbokaite are an artist duo based in Basel. Both are uh, 2012 graduates of the Royal College of Art in London. Their work spans performance, installation, fragrance, sculpture, works on canvas, photography and video. They are the founder of a Young Girl Reading Group from 2013 and ongoing, and co-initiators of its online archive. Gaveda and Kulbokaite are the recipient of the Swiss Performance Art Award in 2021 and among the finalists of the Swiss Art Award in 2021. They have recently published their first monograph with Edizioni Periferia and Pro Helvetica and are the current artist uh, in residence at SPA in uh, St. Petersburg. Wasim Alcindi is the founder and host of the OX Salon, conducting experiments in post-disciplinary collective knowledge practices. The OX Salon provides an informal space for unstructured discussion of unusual topics and collectively authors artistic and pedagogical outputs based on this conversation. A veteran of the blockchain space, Wasim currently works on conceptual design and philosophy of crypto economic system at Block Science. In addition to writing an, edit an editorial responsibility for various publications, including the MIT Computational Law Report. 
Previously, Wasim co-founded and, ed and edited the MIT Media Lab's interdi interdisciplinary crypto economics system, sorry, journal, and chaired the CES 19 and CES 20 conference on campus. Prior to MIT, he was an independent researcher formulating novel approaches to the characterization of crypto graphics assets and networks, such as the regulatory epistemology project token space. Wasim has also curated avant-garde art events, led a creative engineering laboratory, and published open source experimental electronic music, originally with research specialization in the physical. So, sorry, that's like a lot of technical words. Um, sorry for the French accent. <laughs> Um, Angela Yetishan is uh, a, an independent creator from the UK and an artist. As a creative climate change communicator, she focuses on anti-colonial climate justice, knowledge, knowledge system, geography, and contemporary, contemporary speculative fiction. She collaborates widely with artists, activists, speculative fiction authors, and news groups. Angela Curate as Worm uh, Art Plus Ecology, with recent activities including DYCP Research Project on Climate Visual Culture in East Asia in 2019, and the exhibition program Climate Knowledge in Mama Rotterdam in 2020. Through her research-based art practice, she works with video, communal conversation, and speculative fiction, writing to map and reconfigure climate communication and knowledge that center minori minorities minoritized perspective. As a Jerwood Art Fact Digital Fellow and a commissioned artist for Metal Estuary 2021 and Sonic Acts Overexposed Environmental Research Residency, Angela is currently researching and producing projects that respectively focus on climate framing on UK water scarcity, British explosive history and extractivism, and tear gas as a long-term environment pollutant. She is part of Chisnel Gallery Me Collective Artist Development Program, and with Obsidian Coast Hypercom Working Group, she is co-writing a code of practice for grounding man man marginalized cultural workers. Angela also co-founded the London Chinese Science Fiction Group and co-directs the London Science Fiction Research Community. Her writing is published in Science Fiction 2020 MIT Press and Whitechapel Gallery. She holds a joint honors undergraduate in the history of art and Scandinavian study with Norwegian UCL and an MA in climate change, history, culture, society in KCL. And finally, uh, Alison Sperling is currently an international postdoctoral initiative fellow uh, at the Technische Universität Berla Berlin in the Centrum für Interdisziplinäre Frauen and Geschl Oh my God, Geschlechter Forschung Center for Inter Interdisciplinary Women's and Gender Study. She works on weird and science fiction, speculation, feminist and queer theory, contemporary art, and the Anthropocene. Um, okay, thank you everyone uh, for tuning in. We will now start uh, the presentation uh, of... Uh, uh, before we continue, I would like to mention that um, we are spending uh, the total duration of the Athens Biennial within this game uh, called ECO. And with us, uh, we have invited six caretakers um, that help uh, build uh, um, a small community with us in this game. And these caretakers are uh, Victor Timofeev, Steph Holtrieu, Kitty Clark, Raphael Cormier, Parjeng, and Marcel Darienzo. Uh, thank you very much for your help. Uh, in managing uh, this digital environment. Um, and another thank you will uh, is going to Strange Loop Games uh, that is uh, offered us a free server, uh, which is this world, and 20 copies of the game to use uh, during the uh, biennial. If you are interested in joining this game, uh, you can send an email to events at athensbiennial.org in order to get access uh, to the game itself. So we will now go to the location of the presentation of uh, uh, um, Dorota uh, Gavida and Ege Kulbokait.
uh, which is on this island in the middle of the ocean. Uh, we're passing here uh, the campsite of Kitty Clark and I think in a bit we were passing through uh, the little house that Wasim has built <laughs> which includes a uh, very beautiful dam in the hope that he can prevent himself from uh, potential flooding in the future. I will be starting the recording of the Rota and Egle um, in a bit. The lower bound of a landscape is constituted by the earth. Under the same field at which I find myself looking lies the silent but sustaining earth, a vast layer of materiality composed of soil, stone and rock that is, in its own way, as capacious as the sky. But where the sky is eminently visible and the horizon coyly demi-visible, the earth withdraws from sight at every remove. Only the outer surface of the topsoil gives itself to me as a manifest presence. It takes rare glimpses of its upturned depths, excavated earth, cliffs striated with sedimentary deposits, to sense what lies below the surface. The smell of wet soil is known to stimulate a visceral response in people. The odor derived from oils exuded by plants during dry periods is absorbed by clay-based soils and rocks. During rain, the oil is released into the air, along with another compound called geosamin, a metabolic byproduct of actinobacteria, which is emitted by wet soil, producing a distinctive and easily recognizable scent. Petrichor, deriving from Greek, with the meaning of a stone liquid which flows in the veins of God, is the molecular moment of the landscape entering the breathing body. Its release into the air ensues rainfall following a drought. The soil is also a harbinger of multiple fictions, stories to be retold and futures to be inhabited. Landscapes are inhabited with a multiplicity of nature spirits, returning, crawling back from beneath the surface, from the earth, chewing onto the contemporary ecological anxieties. Horror, and folk horror in particular, provides us with an ecological worldview in which human and nature, human and non-human, are thoroughly imbricated, always on the verge of becoming other. Horror is a vehicle for understanding how fear develops alongside inside-outside dichotomy and seeks to consider the construction of the heretic, deviant subject and conversely monstrification and othering of nature as historically intertwined phenomena. Horror is often that which is attributed to being outside, norm, society, which is inherently part of queer experience. Queerness to many is this horror of blurring boundaries a strange distortion between inside and outside. Rise from the earth, from the dark soil, 
Bullets for me. Can I use to lift myself? Ah. Oh, my arms to lean upon. Oh, my soul, my little heart. Oh, make your fingernails into spades, your palms into shovels. Oh, throw the soil onto one side and slab to the other. Turn your hands into shovels, dig yourself out, return to me. The narrative of perpetual return played out between the undead body and the landscape. Malevolent spirits inhabiting Eastern European bogs, such as Topielet or Rusauka, reveal that the past was never actually past at all. The dead, drowned, burned, buried life, they have always lived in the spill, in the landscape and in the folk horror. Many of the Slavic and Baltic nature spirits are often believed to dwell in the natural terrestrial boundaries, especially those delineating the threshold between the human and the natural, field borders, gullies, forest edges, swamps, whirlpools. In fact, the 17th and 18th century Russian historical records that describe both demons and spirits of vernacular belief who lived in the liminalities of nature placed a special ban on prayers performed to demons near wells, rivers and copses, near barns, washing houses and other transitional places. Bram Stoker's Dracula, despite operating in Victorian London, sleeps in crates of soil brought from his native Romania. The soil dust follows the vampire and settles in the space that he inhabits. It is advised to sterilize the Romanian soil in order to disinfect the place of vampiric refuge and the source of their primal power. The Malus Maleficarum 1489 treatise on witchcraft known as the Hammer of the Witches describes the emergence of a demon or vampire whose body, although arising from air, possesses an earthy quality and a density of soil. <laughs> Ela <laughs> 
Lada and her daughter Lela in Baltic mythology are deities that connect soil and the sky and nurture the earth. Their names up to this day are carried through Lithuanian folk songs of thirteenness. Today, the meaning of the word Lelumai, deriving from Lela's name, is still being carried through song as an unconscious chant to the deity. Tesmophoria began as a fertility rite. It dated back to pre-Homeric times. A ritual women conducted in late autumn when seed was to be sown. Demeter, the goddess of the earth, presided as divine patron. The festival story came from Demeter's burial and mourning for her dead daughter, Persephone. The name came from its main action, that of laying things in the earth. Tesmoi in Greek means laying down, in the broad sense of laying down the law. Women prepared for the Tesmophoria with a ritual act making use of pigs, treated in Greek mythology as animals of sacred value. At the end of each spring, they took slaughtered pigs into the pits or megara, dug in the ground. Here, the dead animals were left to putrefy. On the first of the three days of the Thesmophoria, women went into, went into the pits containing the moist remains of the pigs and mixed grain seed into the carcasses. This day was a matter of going, cathodos, and rising up, anodos. For the women rose from the cave to enter into special huts where they sat and slept on the ground. On the second day, the women fasted to commemorate Persephone's death. They mourned by swearing and cursing. On the third day, they retrieved the grain-rich piglets, and the stinking mush was sown into the earth later as a kind of sacred compost. In an Eastern European context, it is language that persists as the primary resistance to oppression, specifically through a stubborn clinging to folklore as a counter network of information. As a type of text, folklore is distinct in that it doesn't belong to any individual or group. It is typically transmitted orally and operates outside of the logics of economic remuneration. It frequently undergoes modification and thus transcends issues of intellectual property. And it is closely linked to the arts, but ultimately stands outside them. The cult of Majanga emerged in the year 965 after the newly christened Polish prince Mieszko I ordered the destruction of all pagan idols. The people are said to have gathered the cherished objects and deity representations and were ordered to drown them in nearby lakes and rivers as a mass spectacle. Sacred trees were cut through the land and their severed branches were set ablaze. The people wept and mourned the loss of their kindred spirits. 
It was said that Majanna, a powerful demon of death, emerged from the amalgamation of the impaired and drowned spirits. Since medieval times, the people felt the compulsion for reenactment of this violent spectacle, which is carried out annually on spring equinox. Out of straw, which is then wrapped in linen and beautified with ribbons and beads, arises the goddess. She is the demon of death, plague and winter, whose effigy embodies cyclical death and rebirth. On the afternoon of March 21st, the first day of spring, young children still play with and torture the idol, gleefully parading it around and dunking it in every trowel and water barrel in the village or city. At dusk, they gather at the riverbank, setting the effigy ablaze and tossing into the water, cheering as the blazing wretch disappears downstream. In Eastern European rural tradition on Thursdays, or most notably on October 31st, the ancestral ghost or Zade would pay the living a visit. In preparation, the bathhouse was heated. The number of chairs, shirts and towels set in the bathhouse equaled the number of invited souls. After bathing, feasting took place. An equivalent number of table settings was to be laid out. The foods would be dark in color and aromatic. They were to resemble the soil. Even babies were kept awake. The presence of death was immediately announced to all domestic animals. Bees were informed by a rhythmic knock on the hive. Attentiveness was endorsed. Silence ruled the house. Doors and windows remained open. Additional food was left at the crossroads and was handed out to the poorer members of society. As Zad simultaneously meant a poor person, leaving only little linguistic disjunction between being ancestor or family and being poor. Let me share this story for those of you who have not read it before. Once upon a time, there was a child who was willful and who would not do as her mother wished. For this reason, God had no pleasure in her and let her become ill, and no doctor could do her any good. And in a short time, she lay on her deathbed. When she had been lowered into a grave and the earth was spread over her, all at once her arm came out again and stretched upwards, and when they had put it in and spread fresh earth over it, it was all to no purpose, for the arm always came out again. Then the mother herself was obliged to go to the grave and strike the arm with a rod, and when she had done that, it was drawn in, and then at last the child had rest beneath the ground. The arm, it came up in a story of violence, the striking arm of the grim story. The arm comes alive after death. The arm is life after death. Before the grim ending, the arm is held up in a moment of suspension. The arm becomes, despite the morbid nature of the story, a signifier of hope. The arm in suspension is still rising. Even after the willful child had been brought down, Something, some spark, some kind of energy persists. There is agency where we thought there was none. The monology was rooted in medieval Europe and the creation of the social stereotype of the witch, a stereotype that was a keystone of an ideological edifice for political persecution, was developed by the Catholic Church in an epoch marked by great political and social upheaval. Although the stereotype had been elaborated in a narrow local context, once developed, it acquired a life of its own. 
While the formal theological construct shaped the official rules by which orthodoxy and heresy were to be judged, the stereotype penetrated and became a part of European folk belief of the popular culture. It became a standard for judgment and a cultural evaluation, which was applied outside the boundaries of the specific context in which it had been conceived. The Spanish conquest of Peru thus transported the devil and his ally, the witch, to the Andes. Confronted with the startlingly different cultures of the New World, the Spanish crown and the Catholic religious authorities began the process of creating institutions that would bind these newly discovered lands to the mother country. An integral part of the colonization process entailed the campaign waged by the church to destroy indigenous religion. Although the clerics who accompanied the first conquistadors and administrators might have engaged in disputes over the nature of the indigenous soul, and over the theological justification of conquest, almost all agreed that the devil was flourishing in the Andes. How else to explain the devotion displayed by these people towards the hills, the trees, the stones, the sun, the moon, rivers, and springs? Celtic legends tell us about large stones with shallow crannies and foot-shaped crevices in their surface. Rainwater collected in these vessels would attain magical properties. It is almost up until this day, women coming back home from work would stop by these rocks to wash their hands and faces and to heal from diseases. Amoko Cabral says the conflict between Lithos rock and Atmos climate is due to the antagonisms between rock and climate. If we admitted the existence of intention and natural phenomena, we could argue that this opposition demands that the rock transforms itself in order to subsist. Neither the rock disappears completely, nor the climatic phenomena cease to operate. Rather, the rock gets integrated into a new form of negation existence. This observation, intention and natural phenomena can be read as an urge to allow for a kind of rock agency. The rock soil is carrier of prose, a narrative, the substrate where everything is inscribed. This equals what is described as a geophysical force. This he writes, is what in part we are in our collective existence. It is neither a subject nor an object. In staying with the trouble, making kin in the Cthulhu scene, Don Harway thinks through the demon familiar spider, Pimoa Cthulhu, writing, a work with string figures as a theoretical trope, a way to think with, a host of companions in sympathetic threading, felting, tangling, tracking, and sorting, a work with and in a step that is science fiction, speculative fabulation, string figures, speculative feminism, science fact so far, as material semiotic composting, as theory in the mud, as model. But what if the mud does not stop flowing, leaks in its permanence through all the crevices? In the art of living on a damaged planet, Nils Pavon describes the eruption of the Sidoarjo mud volcano, informally called Lucy, that erupted in Indonesia in 2006, shortly after the company PT Lapindo Grandas Incorporation had begun exploratory drilling for gas in the late Miocene stratum, 2,800 meters below the surface of the earth. The toxic mud continues on leaking after the first humanly made volcanic eruption in planetary history. The 2012 movie Hantu Lumpur Lapinda, The Ghost of the Lapinda Mud, is based on the narrative of these tragic events, an example of film mystique a popular movie genre that combines soft eroticism with horror stories, featuring the many varieties of spirits and ghosts in the Indonesian mystical universe. Hantu Lumpur Lapindo is the story of a striptease dancer who is murdered by a gang of organ thieves after they have removed her heart. The gang dumps her body in the Lapindo mud, but the ghost rises, smeared in mud, to haunt the gang and kill its members one by one. In the movie, 
Mud is a spiritual index of vengeance against capitalist mark, personal greed, and social betrayal. Until recently, the notion that humans could have an impact on the tectonics of the earth itself was laughable. Not so anymore. Industrially produced tectonics have become an increasingly recognized risk, since fracking and high pressure injection wells have been shown to generate an increase in earthquake activity. Oh, rise, Mariola, from the earth, from the dark soil, oh, Mariola, mine. What legs for me can I use to lift myself? Oh, what arms to lean upon? Oh, my soul, my little heart, I'll make your fingernails into spades, your palms into shovels, oh, Mariola, mine. Oh, throw the soil onto one side and the slab to the other. Oh, Mariola mine, turn your hands into shovels, dig yourself out, return to me. Thus goes the Greek Mariola Laman song of longing, or xenitia, a sense of catastrophic loss characterized by a frenzied yearning for home. Every year, the people of Epirus in northern Greece hold Panegyria, multi-day music intensive events in which they mourn their losses and celebrate what remains. Panegyria are religious festivals and they are tied to the patron saint of the village church and are held on the day dedicated to honoring the life of that saint as determined by the Greek Orthodox calendar. There is speculation that the Panegyria have pagan roots, that the priests simply assimilated them. Regardless, Panegyria have always aimed to treat Xenithia with a hefty dose of barea, a company of friends. Panegyria are a way for the village to pay homage not just to its saints, but also to its missing, those who left, those who are otherwise exiled, and then to exalt in the remaining togetherness, however fleeting it may be. At this moment, a process of global mutation was already underway. We were undergoing social and political changes as profound as those that transpired in early modernity. We're still in the throes of the transition from a written to a cyber oral society, from an industrial to an immaterial economy, from a form of disciplinary and architectural control to forms of micro prosthetic and media cybernetic control. Colonialism began the biologization of the state we currently live under a moment when the statistical forms of knowledge are applied in monitoring the population, used in management and the prediction of evolutionary conditions, a period defined by a significant move away from earlier notions of the state grounded in territory. Bodies become expanded territories, lands for sovereign intervention, where the managerial hand has a say about the liability of one's own biorhythms. Petrochor is the molecular moment of the landscape entering the breathing body. When excited noble gases emerge as photons in a fluorescent lamp, they emerge through the bathroom of whose walls the photons reflect. When a cloud of dusty spores emerges as moldy peach rocks in a forgotten bowl, the dust emerges for the currents of air in the deserted kitchen. When a kettle boils unseen, the steam emerges for the less excited particles in the water on the stove and for the framed photograph on the windowsill whose glass it coats with a fine layer of mist. Weirdness that inhabits human and non-human bodies as it does the environment imbricates us in complex relations that reveal a mutual desire for co-constitution. Judith Butler makes a case for queer ecology because she shows how heterosexist gender performance produces a metaphysical manifold that separates inside from outside. The inside-outside manifold is fundamental for thinking the environment as a metaphysical closed system, nature. This is impossible to construe without violence. She looks at the paintings. She looks into them. Every one of them is a picture of Lucy. 
You can't see her exactly, but she is there. And behind the pink stone island, or be the one behind that. In the picture of the cliff, she is hidden by the clutch of fallen rocks towards the bottom. In the one of the river shore, she is crouching beneath an overturned canoe. In the yellow autumn woods, she's behind the tree that cannot be seen because of the other trees, over beside the blue sliver of pond. But if you walked into the picture and found the tree, it would be the wrong one because the right one is further on. Pejnava illa belever ya puliulul illul puliul o koch tusialiu o dod ejbe no glavio stagdlavi Stagiot e Pebolxie Benijava Svesniova Pestami Stengdius Belche Fila Besnidia Okay, uh, thank you, Dorota uh, Gavidain. Igle Kulbokaite, that was really a beautiful, uh, beautiful text. I'm totally somewhere else. Um, okay, and the next um, uh, person uh, presenting is going to be uh, Wasim Al Sindi. Um, Wasim, uh, where are you? <laughs> where are you? <laughs> are you here? <laughs> I, I, in the game, I think I'm standing on top of my house. But okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, then we go back in, to si in, in cyberspace. I'm right here. All okay. right. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, so yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't have anything quite as uh, 
uh, ethereal and otherworldly is what we just heard. Uh, I, I suppose my, um, my my matters of focus and, and concern are a little bit more mundane. Uh, so w I was thinking about um, this world that we've been living in for the past few weeks and that we'll continue to live in for a few more weeks. And um, uh, in this game, quite a lot of the, the activity, I guess you could think of it as grinding. So we are kind of, um, as you can see as we go around the game, digging holes in the ground, chopping wood, using pickaxes to, to mine rocks. So we're essentially gathering resources and then um, you know, processing them. They're the raw materials of this, of, this, of this world. Then we're processing those and we're turning those into uh, refined goods, things that we can use, houses that we can live in and so on. And so like really what I, uh, I see here are a bunch of essentially like quite primitive resource-based economies, at least as far as we got in the game in the last few weeks. And my, my ambition, my hope was that we could actually, um, that we could actually do quite a lot of, um, quite a lot more in terms of uh, 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 building examples of resource-based economic systems, like for trading and for commerce in the game. Unfortunately, um, it takes quite a long time to do stuff in the game, a lot of time. Um, and so we are still at the chopping wood, um, making logs, digging sand and dirt out of the ground, uh, mining shale and clay. And uh, yeah, you can see up here, actually, I just put these things on the roof, not that they're usable there, uh, but we wanted to start building a community in, in one place, a little bit inland, um, so we can then start to, uh, you know, uh, engage in trade and, and uh, communication, the sorts of uh, antecedents to a society that would need uh, some kind of more sophisticated uh, system of uh, economic uh, 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 trade than just simple barter. So let's think about like the human story on on our planet, on planet Earth, and how that might translate to what we see, uh, what we see here. And so, um, you know, we a, a bit like what's happening in the game. We kind of started off building primitive tools, you know, in the Stone Age, and then the you know, Bronze and Iron Age. Uh, we then started uh, getting refined uh, materials uh, and then we started building more sophisticated um, systems. And so uh, one of the earliest ways of, uh, was let, you can think of money or like these resource-based economic systems as a way of keeping track of things, as a way of, of, of keeping records. Uh, and so there's a, a research, a monetary research called Coach Lakota, and he defined money as memory. So really what we're trying to do with money and with resource-based economic systems is to try and make some kind of shared system of record keeping. And, uh, you know, that is one of the functions that a lot of uh, monies uh, keep. Um, and so, you know, we're also kind of in a metaverse here. We're kind of in a, a virtual environment. And I'm sure everybody here has noticed that, you know, there are uh, the, you know, other kinds of virtual environments uh, like, you know, like blockchains and cryptocurrencies. And there are things that seem to be kind of like resources on those and you know, in the art world everyone is talking about things like nfts non-fungible tokens but i just want to say that like this is actually not really anything new we've had tokens as you know ways of recording information and, and sharing that and passing it around for thousands of years so like uh, you know my forebears in the sumeria ancient mesopotamia uh, were writing um in cuneiform on uh, clay tablets thousands of years ago and one of the things they were doing, apart from passing myths and legends and, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, stories about their communities, lore, folklore, they were also recording, doing accounting, more boring things, you know, like you owe me this, I owe you that, uh, sent, give me this in a year's time, you, you married my daughter, then, you know, this is the uh, house that, uh, you know, we own together, all this kind of stuff. Um, and so uh, th these ways of keeping record of who owns what, who went to get what and who you know uh, can can participate in what and nothing new and so yeah i work with things like cryptocurrencies um and uh, one of the examples that a lot of people like to use on the kind of monetary philosophical side is a pacific island called yap uh, it's, it's quite an isolated island deep in the pacific and they had this very interesting way of uh, recording uh, uh who own, who owes what who owns what and who owes what they had these gigantic stones called rai stones rai and they were not available on the island. You had to get them from another place, right? And so you had to build a boat, sail in the Pacific Ocean, like this is a tortuous and per perilous journey, uh, to go get one of these stones. You might not come back alive. The stone might fall in the sea. So this is like 
one of the things that I, this game reminds me of and one of the concepts that is made explicit in cryptocurrencies, which is what we call proof of work. And so the idea of digging these, like you can see as we go around the screen, uh, we are doing work, you know, digging holes in the ground, building stuff. This is like, this is effort, it's energy. The energy ultimately, you know, initially came from the sun, gets captured by plants, animals eat those plants, we eat all of that or we harness all of that. We dig stuff out of the ground, it might have come from a supernova, it might have come from, um, you know, uh, the processes in the heart of the earth. And, and so what these things are really doing is you're kind of um, showing your work. And so what the islanders of Yap did was they used to sail on these perilous journeys on rafts and small boats, try to get these stones and bring them back. And these stones were considered valuable on the island because they were scarce and because they signified the amount of work expended. And so, for example, if an islander would marry a, a, a fellow islander, there might be a transfer of ownership of these gigantic stones. But they wouldn't actually move. They wouldn't move the stone from one place to another. They were huge. They didn't need to move them because the uh, community was small enough that everybody knew who owned what. So this was a very simple uh, 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 system of record keeping. But what then, uh, something even more interesting uh, uh, emerged when we uh, historians started to look through uh, the way the society worked, which is sometimes the islanders would not be successful in bringing the, the stone back, it might fall in the sea or, or whatever. But even if they were fallen in the sea, they still counted in the monetary system. Um, so the work was done, but uh, even though you don't have the, um, the resource itself, the extant material resource to hand, these resources were still counted as part of the monetary system. And I think that's something uh, super interesting. And just a little side note on that, there was um, another uh, interesting, I guess, more modern example of a, a hermetically sealed economic system is, believe it or not, a prison. So like imagine a prison in the United States um, and in there, you don't have dollars. You don't have, you don't have like the conventional currencies you might imagine. So the currencies might be things like packets of cigarettes, or they might be even, I've even heard a story by a, a famous Bitcoiner that had to, had to go away for a while. Um, uh, tins of sardines, packets of sardines. And these things can make their own monetary system. As long as everybody collectively agrees that this thing can be, has value, it's kind of scarce, it's got this kind of proof of work, or it's hard to, hard to forge, People can agree that these things are kind of function as a as a money. So the, the story that, that that this Bitcoin had told about the the packets of sardines is really interesting, because uh, there were almost like it was almost like a dual monetary system. There was one kind of sardines that were still good to eat, and there were the other ones that were old and they were not good to eat. But they both still counted as money. They just had different values, and that almost sounds a bit like um, the bimetallic. Uh, um, uh, system of currency that we had before paper money where gold and silver were used um, uh, as a you know something that was uh, h hard to dig out of the ground it's scarce and therefore um, we can kind of agree that it has value but what, ha what seems to happen over time is you know people have an incentive to kind of game these economic systems so some of the earliest um, monetary systems we had on this planet were things like um, uh, seashells or glass beads so imagine a small desert community and sand melts in the heat and turns into glass, but not very much of it. So it's, it's considered scarce. And so the, the story goes, and I don't know how true this is, it might be apocryphal, but um, the story goes that uh, the Portuguese, who are some of the earliest colonialists to arrive in different parts of Africa, arrived in some of these communities, looked around and thought, oh, that's their money, we'll be right back. And they came back with an absolute ton of glass and that, that is one of the stories about how slavery started. Like they had so much money, inverted commas money, the local economic system, that they gained it because this thing was not universally scarce. It was only locally scarce. And so one of the trends that we see, um, at, um, and I, you know, we'll contextualize this to the metaverse and to digital scarcity soon, is this kind of um, uh, growing uh, prevalence of scarcity from something local, like some glass beads or some seashells, to something that's more global, like uh, gold and silver, uh, to something that might be universally enforced, uh, say through an algorithm, and you might take an example of something like uh, Bitcoin or NFTs. Um, now we'll say something about gold and silver, because um, there's also some interesting things there that not everyone is um, necessarily aware of or thinking of. So um, we think of gold and silver as very scarce. They can kind of come out of supernovas, they, which seems limited. There's, you know, gold is expensive on this planet. It's a signifier of wealth and status. Um, but not many people uh, realize that most of the gold on planet Earth is not what they think it is. It's not in Fort Knox. It's not in um, 
bank vaults. It's not round the neck of uh, wrappers or, or whatever else. It's actually in the sea, in the oceans, in the water. There is more gold uh, in terms of number of atoms in the sea than there is above or below the ground on land. We're pretty sure about that. So why, haven't, why aren't we getting out of the sea? Well, it's hard to get. That's why. Like, so there's a resistance to uh, mining the sea. Um, and so uh, have a think about this. Say the price of gold goes up two times, five times, ten times overnight. You know that loads of people will go digging holes in the ground, you know, and damn the ecological externalities and all the rest of that. They are incentivized by money or like by uh, gains, let's say, you know, profit. Um, but uh, getting this, the water out, the gold out of the sea is actually quite hard. Now, I used to be um, a chemist and a physicist, and one of the uh, professors I used to work with at the University of Nottingham was a specialist in this thing called metal organic frameworks. And these are kind of like sieves, like meshes, but molecular sized they're meshes with molecular sized holes in them and you can vary the size of the hole depending on the size of the atom and then you can go fishing in the sea for atoms so they're already doing this for uranium uranium is obviously extremely valuable for uh, nuclear power and also for uh, <clears throat> weapons uh, and so uh, i expect it's only a matter of time before we go fishing in the sea for uh, silver and gold i don't think we can do it in this game uh, maybe uh, if uh, Strange Loop will, uh, or yeah, Strange Loop will uh, make a make an expansion pack. But um, yeah, I just want to illustrate that because this idea of scarcity is something that um, is not necessarily universal. It's, it's something that can be gamed, and so th that's one of the reasons that some monetary economists and philosophers are very interested in things like Bitcoin, because they see this as a universal scarcity. There's only ever going to be a certain number of these coins. Um, you can't. It's very hard to cheat the system uh, in itself. Uh, so people try other things. People like try to do scams, try to get the, your Bitcoin out of you, try to trade their coins for other coins so they can speculate and make more of them. And even people make kind of copy and paste, copycat clone coins um, so that they've got more coins and they can trade and speculate on the value of those. Um, so, yeah, I think now that we've said something about um, resource economies and, and digital scarcity, I, I thought it'd be interesting to uh, tie it back to the back to the game. So uh, quite a few of us have actually had some technical problems running the game. Um, um, uh, yeah, I think it's okay to talk about uh, how the sausage is made here. We're, you know, we're all, we're all, we're all adults here. Um, so yeah, I was, I'm a kind of, I'm a Linux guy. Uh, I like to run yeah, Unix and I, don't, I like open source stuff. I don't really like running Windows and things like that. And so I uh, tried to get this game running on my Linux laptop and I failed. And I tried to get it running on, when I came back to Berlin from Athens on a very powerful computer and I also failed on Linux. And so I find myself back in, in Windows uh, on a very powerful computer that I used for um, data science, machine learning, kind of stone block, uh, data analysis kind of stuff. Um, and that's the, these are the only computers that can run it. Like got very fast graphics card in it, uh, massive, you know, ton of RAM and all the rest of it. And I know that a few of our colleagues that um, are participating in the game as, uh, you know, as participants like myself and all else as the caretakers haven't been able to run the game. Uh, they literally can't get it to work, or if they get it to work, it kind of, um, you know, their computer starts to melt down. Um, and so uh, that is actually an interesting example of a resource-based inequality, right? So many of our colleagues are um, uh, precarious people working in creative industries, and um, they don't have access to top-of-the-line equipment necessarily. And, uh, you know, I, I love the Athens Biennale. I think it's a beautiful artist uh, run uh, and organized event. I also appreciate that the resources are limited uh, in, you know, there. Like Athens is, and Greece are not um, the richest countries in the world. And the art world is also not the best resource base when we are talking about the kind of more underground and vanguard things. And so the amount of resources we have to like, you know, um, facilitate running the game on our side are also limited. And so that's kind of a, yeah, that's kind of a constraint that we've had on um, on trying to get the game going and trying to get everyone in. And obviously, if we want to build an economic system, it kind of relies on a community, relies on a bunch of us pulling together. Um, so for a long time, we're sitting kind of on the roof of my uh, beach house at the moment. Um, I was just kind of here chopping wood and uh, mining rocks by myself. I didn't really get very much, didn't really get very much done um, in terms of um, like the a collaborative side because it was quite hard for a lot of people to join the game um, and so yeah I think that's that's also something that's kind of kind of interesting and I will just say a couple of things about what we did in the game and how that might relate to um, 
uh, resource-based economies that we see in in the real world today. Uh, so one of the things that uh, and then Alwaz pointed out a couple of days ago is maybe you can show the stockpile, the chain of stockpiles that uh, I set up as we go kind of up the hill towards Kitty's place. Um, I w it was pointed out that so we have these stockpiles that are kind of like places we can store uh, gear and equipment and whatever. And it was pointed out that if you put, you can make a chain of them about five or ten blocks apart, and then they all kind of connect together. Um, and so that, I mean, I, I call that a stock chain, which is uh, like a blockchain, but different. <laughs> and what, and uh, one of the things that reminds me of is uh, this uh, antiquated idea of the, um, or of the old idea of the Silk Road, the kind of the, 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 the trade passage between Europe and Asia that is now being replicated in the, in the, in the current uh, day by the um, Chinese uh, regime now under the auspices of the One Belt, One Road, where they're building infrastructure, road, rail and uh, a sea infrastructure outwards from China so that they can connect to a lot of their target markets. So there's now like, a, for example, a train that runs from Beijing to Belgrade to the um, edge of the European Union. And that is like bringing freight from Beijing to the doorstep of the European Union. So yeah, if, if you've ever bought something from AliExpress and it's taken two months to arrive or something like that, I think that's why they're I think that's why this is all happening. Uh, they're trying to kind of cement these trade routes uh, for, um, you know, kind of economic supremacy. And that's definitely not what I've been trying to do. I was just trying to find a way to link up to my friends in the game and uh, share resources a bit better so we can um, build, a, build a little community and, and a little society. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I thought that was an interesting parallel that, that we could draw. Um, I think I'm just about out of... Um, out of interesting things to say on that one. I just wanted to say a, a little bit about, um, yeah, on the um, kind of <clears throat> ecological impacts and externalities of the game. And I'll wrap in, in a minute or so. And so we are obviously going around and digging things out of the ground and chopping down trees. You can see felled trees and, and uh, kind of the rubble and detritus of human activity everywhere we go. And that's kind of unavoidable in this game. Like you kind of have to do that to progress in a way that's realistic. But here again, we see humans kind of exerting their supremacy on, on ecology. And uh, I'm reminded of this interesting uh, concept uh, uh, called necroeconomics, which I think um, Warren Montag might have coined in 2005. I'm not sure of the exact uh, source of it, uh, but this is kind of like we are killing everything around us uh, so that we can progress. And actually I see some similarities with how cryptocurrencies work with the mining. Uh, they kind of do this as well, but they're doing it uh, to us. And the last thing I'll say is, we may not have seen it yet, but there's a meteor circling the planet. I hope we get to discuss it at some point. And uh, very soon, that meteor is going to come a bit closer to the planet, and uh, it might hit the planet, and then uh, we might be living in some kind of uh, different environment. And so that is an interesting example of how then we become part of the necroeconomics, like we become the dinosaurs in this, in this world. Uh, so then we're with the animals and we're with the plants, and something else is kind of... Um, is uh, uh, is uh, impacting and affecting us. Um, so I think I'll I think I'll wrap there. And um, yeah, thanks very much for, for for inviting me to participate in the game. It's been loads of fun, and I hope we can continue to uh, to build our little world. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> it was very nice spending time with you, chopping and trying to <laughs> trying actually to look for iron as well in order to be able to get different types of tools, etc. But uh, Failing at it. F failing very badly <laughs> at it. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, um, I guess we're going to come back to this um, um, idea of this difficulty going into the game also with uh, Alison a little bit uh, later after Angela's uh, presentation. Uh, but yeah, that's always like a, a very good point. Uh, access, who gets access to what and... Uh, yeah, that's especially true with gaming, I think. Um, uh, thank you, Wasim. We're now going to move on to uh, Angela uh, Chan. And for this, we will make our way to uh, a river, which I'm looking for now. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, hi. I'm really excited to take everyone swimming um, because we have reached daytime. I'm sure we can go swimming at night time as well. Um, but over the course of our session in this game, we've gone from moonlight to sunlight. And 
I'm really going to uh, hope to spend a lot of time in the water with you. Um, we're going to go to the very top of the globe and then go downstream and swim and hopefully see if I can see a shark there, see different types of fish. Um, and I really want to, you know, thank and uh, pick up on what Wasim was talking about. Um, one of the things that kind of uh, was highlighted to me, what you said was how, you know, exchanging tokens has been like a long, uh, long history of communication. And maybe I can anchor it like a bit of what I want to talk about um, with this point that actually owning and accounting, we can then we can then think about um, the accountability of the processes um, that we actually uh, have in relationship with the, the earth and with each other's people and um, start thinking about uh, some observations that I've been having in the past year or so um, in terms of water scarcity and uh, the treatment of water uh, aligned with climate change and climate injustice around the world. And um, as we're moving closer to the, the, the water spaces, the water body in the game, um, maybe I can kind of like talk through some of the themes that I've been working on in my own work. Um, quite recently, there was an exhibition that just um, just closed the other weekend uh, with one of my works called Rain Paradox. And the title of this actually um, comes from... Actually, I'm, I'm going to pause. At, um, and I wonder whether the audio is working well for everyone and whether, Micah, you, you would like to mute um, your microphone, if that might help. Or maybe it's from me. Um, we hear you uh, quite well. Um... Sure. Would you be able to mic uh, mute your microphone, please? Yeah, that sounds great, actually. Um, that <laughs> the noise has gone, and I feel like, wow, maybe maybe we should turn it back on when we go underwater um, to hear some sort of um, so, some of the reverberations uh, with the sea life. Um, I love this overgrown area we're wandering through now um and so yeah returning to the rain paradox this actually takes its name from a, a report that was put out in 2020 and it was sponsored by uh rb finish which is a dishwasher tablet company uh the one that you know produces all the cleaning tablets and supported by the british government's environmental agency and the title of that report was called The Great British Rain Paradox. And um, it basically highlighted a paradox that the, the British public, 2000 of which um, were surveyed um, for, the, uh, for the kind of research they were doing, um, were the majority thought that, well, the UK, it rains so much, there must be plentiful water, we're not going to have water scarcity issues in the near future. Um, in within 20 years, in fact, which is what's um, projected by climate scientists. And I find this quite problematic, not only because uh, the funder of the reports is a corporate um, that corporation that you know obviously advocates for you to use uh, dishwashers and uh, kind of uh, yeah buy their appliances or buy their kind of products, um, but it also highlights or or kind of situates its perspective um, from a point of, well, seeing is believing. You see the rain fall outside your window. You then believe that we have plenty of water, but the truth is that we don't. And as the government, as the corporations, we're telling you, the public, um, that you can, you know, you can turn this around by conserving your water use and, uh, you know, bearing in mind in the, the report, it, it highlights uh, the population growth in the UK that's anticipated. It's it's talking about climate change issues that are also going to be stretching on um, resources. Um, uh, and I find it, I find it.
So we lost Angela. Um, Is anyone else still there and able to hear us or? I can hear you guys, but yeah, okay. I lost Angela. Okay. Mm, okay. <laughs> Um, so, is she, is she still online and just muted or? I feel like she might, she is still online. I can see her, okay. but she is somehow not, um, yeah, it's either she has dropped all low internet or, yeah. I sent her a private message um, on another channel. Let's see if that helps, but she's writing to me now. That's her internet file. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Does uh, maybe I should present since mine's only 13 minutes and then she'll come back? Yeah, oh, I, I think, think that's, that's a good idea. That's a very good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Just to give her a little less stress. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, so we will continue with the recording of Alison Sperling. Um, so we will turn off our microphone and switch to the audio file. To everyone in this world and in other worlds, thanks for being here. Uh, and thanks to the Mycological Twist and to the organizers of the Athens Biennale. It's been a lot of fun and especially interesting for me to think about writing something to be delivered in the game, which I've never really done before. And so it's got me thinking a lot about the spaces and tone and general mode in which we talk about climate change issues in the humanities and in the arts, um, and particularly in the environmental humanities where I largely reside uh, institutionally. <clears throat> I've been thinking a lot lately about how I write and for whom, especially as it relates to theory, and so I'm happy to have the opportunity to hang out here today and consider a mode of address that's really new for me, and to think about being in this game as participating in a kind of climate fiction, as opposed to and related to science fiction, um, a mode which I think this game and these artists are very much um, working within. <clears throat> so I guess it should be said from the outset that I'm not much of a game player um, and I'm certainly not in game studies. So I visit you all with um, a background in science, science fiction and feminist and queer theories of toxicity in the Anthropocene, um, just so you have a sense of, of where I'm coming from. Uh, to be honest, I've had a bit of trouble getting here, I have to say. I was thinking originally when I arrived, I would talk about play in relation to something like, quote, affecting real change in the world, right? As if such a distinction can or should be drawn. Um, but I actually haven't gotten to play yet, uh, so I'm hoping that others will have more to say about that. I was also hoping that um, I would be able to utilize the game world um, a bit more and be a bit more participatory in my brief contribution today, so my apologies for not being able to do that. <clears throat> But surely there is still a lot to say about the various technical difficulties that games like this can present in relation to what the game is about in terms of environmental or ecologically framed gaming or games or something like nature or the environment, categories that have for a very long time been troubled and yet remain somehow distinct from the human, at least in the popular imagination, is more than just a setting or a backdrop, right? So. <clears throat> Even though once nature or the environment become more than a backdrop, as is the case here, it also becomes extractable, a resource. Um, so this is one of the main dilemmas of the project. As a Mac user, my computer first wouldn't give me permissions to open the game. Then it refused to run it and wanted instead to move it to the trash. So I couldn't get in. <laughs> Um, yet this refusal and blockage of my ability even to get into the world, um, though frustrating, is also kind of interesting in itself. The disruption of the experience, I mean of the intent to play, or as the artist duo describes in the project's proposal, the act of being both mentally deeply involved with the action being performed while being apparently physically at rest. And I would assume that they mean to place some emphasis on the apparently here. 
so that the difficulties that one accepts when um, designing or playing a game like Eco, which is notorious as far as I've read for being a bit touchy, especially with older operating systems, already presents the project um, and its platform as a bit precarious. And so that one's effort to play or to experiment or to collaborate for a better world um, or to save the world even, right, as if one wouldn't come up against endless obstacles already, is again thwarted by failing technologies as a, a kind of tongue-in-cheek check-in about what media uh, and other technologies uh, can offer and what they do when, what we do when they fail, if we are going to rely on them for something, even if it is play, right, and what it is, uh, what that is, is of course up for debate. Eco um, arguably offers a kind of unstructured play that presents a game environment or a game as environment, um, which I'm thinking along with Alenda Chang, that gives players a chance to learn about certain consequences or at least the kinds of exchanges down to the level of things like proteins for nutrition um, that one intakes that is the minimum required for certain forms of labor, for example. As Chang writes, games are opportunities to create entirely new sets of relations outside of those based on dominance or manipulation. More environmentally realistic games could affect our understanding of real world environmental issues, either by implicitly or explicitly modeling different forms of our individual and collective environmental agency. This is part of why I'm drawn to the game and to the project here. Um, for the same reason, it kind of puts me off and maybe this says more about me than the game. Um, the difficulties that present themselves when trying to play, right, up to the coordination with agreeing on a time when everyone is free, um, uh, you know, this, this fact that the game attempts to, um, to mimic the kind of care and knowledge that it actually takes to uh, what we might call offsetting oneself, to offset oneself, or to lessen one's carbon footprint, for example, makes it difficult to play, but demonstrates a set of values or principles that we can take or leave. And not least amongst these principles is that everything can be thought of in terms of exchange according to a kind of universal accounting system. Chang again, why must games replicate the same kind of costly obliviousness we see every day in the non-virtual world? The refusal to acknowledge or even attempt to understand our role in climate change, environmental degradation and species loss, when they could instead take such factors into account with very interesting results. Is this what it looks like to live less obliviously? What do we need to know to live more ethically in relation to, not, to the non-human world around us that would lead to more environmentally friendly or sustainable practices, for example? What are the bare minimums that we need to survive? What is the line between mere survival and flourishing and at what cost? And a reminder that extractive capitalism necessitates the obscurity of these kinds of knowledges that the game relies on revealing or making clear. I'm not a game studies scholar, but it would not surprise me if those who have written about this game or games like it, which are um, slow, like they operate at a particular temporality and relatively complex, that they flirt with what play means altogether in this context, right? When does an act become more or less than play or something other than play altogether? I'm thinking also here about the ways in which one measures certain acts of harm um, and how different games play this out. <clears throat> so Michelle Murphy has this essay I always return to called Alter Life and Decolonial Chemical Relations. She talks in this essay about um, um, our chemical surround, right? The infrastructure of our chemical relations are for a number of reasons largely imperceptible. So, you know, the stuff in the air or the water, chemicals, radionuclides, um, silica, microplastics, etc. <clears throat> And in order to make these chemicals um, and these relations perceptible, techno-scientific research has tended to measure rela these relations by the harm that they do to bodies. And she writes that in its focus on collecting what she calls the data of damage, much North American environmental biomedical research surveys and pathologizes already dispossessed communities. Murphy is working to build on decolonial indigenous and feminist scholar Eve Tuck's work who has similarly called for a suspension of damage-based research that amplifies the burdens of settler colonial and racist violence. I raise this idea only to probe a bit into the kinds of measurements and values attached to certain acts that many humans are complicit in, whether they have actually done them themselves or not, right? Things like chopping down a tree, um, killing and eating an animal, burning a fire to keep warm. 
Murphy points to the Native Youth Sexual Health Network in Toronto, where she teaches, as an example of how to think against the data of damage, um, which utilizes a lesson from Indigenous reproductive justice projects, and that is that violence on the land is violence on our bodies, right? So to pollute the water is to pollute relations with the water. <clears throat> Murphy writes, even the ordinary acts of driving, buying, working, fishing, or sheltering are entangled in a long arc of extractive colonialism. So a decolonial feminist sense of enmeshed land and body entails affirming more consensual ways of being together within these extensive, non-innocent chemical entanglements. Her concept of alter life is a figuration of chemical exposures that attempts to be as much about figuring life and responsibilities beyond the individualized body as it is about acknowledging extensive chemical relations. Certainly the game is also interested, in, at least in part, in the idea of non-innocent entanglements and the notion that to become more precisely aware of the effects of your actions in game would maybe lead you to make better choices outside of the game. <clears throat> I'm wondering first how games like this one might further imagine or trouble the individualized body in the way that these scholars are invested in, and also might further imagine other more imperceptible relations and matter that traffics between bodies, human and not. It's not a metaphor when Mel Chen says that when you walk by them, they inhale you, right? So I also wonder about how Murphy and Tuck's position against uh, taking a data of damage would fit into how the, uh, how the structure of the game, which again asks players to be very aware of their actions and choices, um, would, would operate not in relation um, to damage, which I think the game, you know, it does operate uh, not only in relation to damage, though largely so. <clears throat> Eco is what video game critic and writer Cameron Kunzelman has called a direct intervention game, where players are confronted with the consequences of their actions, however large or minute. These kinds of games, as opposed to what he calls games based more solely on simulation or affect, are the most promising because they focus players' attentions on both the systemic and infrastructural, as well as on the role of the individual and choices that one makes. Of course, one of the questions the project raises is, uh, what is the role of play in gaming in the context of climate catastrophe, or here as asteroid catastrophe? Which I think, um, you know, sometimes, um, unfairly, gaming is forced to answer this question more than other media. Um, but as the artists point out, um, this is at least in part to becoming other, um, to becoming avatar, a separation of a sort from one's body that allows for experimentation or coming to know something about the world you may learn better by doing or often by failing without incurring real consequences. As Kunzelman rightly points out, Eco is not a climate change game. Um, Eco, sorry, Eco is a, a climate change game um, or a climate fiction, but one that is not focused, at least not directly, on deterring climate change. So in the context of climate or something akin to conservation or environmentally friendly and sustainable practices, the game is interested in them insofar as they lead to the cooperation of building something that can stop an asteroid headed to Earth and or some kind of what we might call balance and extractive and polluted practices that are necessitated by this work. This might be why in a passage Kunzelman also points to, critic Alice Bell has described her experience of playing as occupying a tiny homestead that was a center of a zone of one woman destruction. There is no way to save the planet without being a destructive force, as is very likely not news to anyone here. The questions of how one navigates that reality of recognizing oneself, um, one's very being as itself a pollutant that needs to be offset is a really difficult one. Part of what gaming can do that other media can't um, allow for is the, that it forces or asks you to make certain choices. You have to do something, everything you do, every step, every inhalation, every exhalation, every act of survival, much less survivance to borrow from Gerald Visenor, or even a notion of flourishing comes at the cost of others. But just as it can also, importantly, enable, support, and enliven others. Thank you for listening. Okay, thank you very much, Alison. Um, so I think, um, yes, it was, um, yeah, it's very nice. I think it's also very nice in the way it's uh, echoing um, 
some of the comments of Wasim and also to some extent I think uh, what Angela had started talking about uh, as well. Um, uh, Hello everyone again. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi again. I was lost because I saw that we were treading water in the middle of the lake at the top of the mountain for quite a while <laughs> and I was thinking how, how, are we, how are we sustaining this? You know, do we have enough energy to keep going at this rate? <laughs> and I think that may be in the game that we swam too much earlier this morning and that upset the sharks. And so maybe they had a bit of a chew on the, you know, deep sea cables for our internet. Um, and so the curse of, uh, you know, ecological destruction uh, we just experience right now. Um, yeah, I, I'd like to kind of pick up on where I left off, um, I was talking about the RAIN paradox, um, this research project that had been inspired by um, the Great British RAIN paradox reports that was put out um, last year by RB Finnish and supported by the uh, British government's uh, environmental agency. And um, I ask Michael to mute your mic again, if that's possible, please. Um, and so with this report, it was quite quite problematic, as I mentioned earlier, that it, it put a parallel on, you know, uh, population increase with climate issues. This is very problematic, like pro-Malthusian um, discourse that basically takes far-right uh, agendas into the climate uh, discussion, saying that we must protect our resources against... Um, uh, people who don't belong here. This, you know, aligns very well with the Tory government's uh, uh, anti-immigration uh, sentiments and uh, policies um, that we're seeing more and more of. So the eco-fascism that is rising, um, not only in the global north uh, climate movements, but also in the mainstream media, is something that we need to be really, really aware of and uh, move very critically to, um, to you know, recenter the attention on those who are the most vulnerable in light of climate change. Now we're swimming with the shark that bits our internet cable. And um, I want to kind of uh, refocus uh, this, this, you know, quite brief um, presentation or chat with you to talk about how timelines is something that's really come up in my work in my past year or so of thinking about water and water scarcity and public climate framings and who gets to uh, who has the power to tell these narratives because essentially um the report um is archived on the government's website but what is then left out uh that doesn't get the official authoritative narrative um and what then uh, actually happens when the hegemonic narrative is one that quite calculatedly erases uh, the more vulnerable, marginalised, minoritised stories uh, about contemporary climate change, as well as historical colonial histories of climate change. How does that then inform the future narratives that we're going to be having about um, our environment and about the changing uh, climate so specifically about this water report, I was very concerned that um, with this climate scientists projecting water scarcity in the UK um, in 20 years time, people can, you know, go onto the government website uh, in what, 20 to 40 and look up this document, this archive document and say that, oh yeah, they were, they, were, they told us, they, they told us how to conserve water, they told us to you use dishwashers rather than use the tap to wash our dishes to conserve water. You know, they told us as citizens and as consumers of water what to do. Um, and and then, you know, have the narrative uh, fixed that it was the citizen or, you know, the way that people were framed in the report is that consumers of water, uh, the, the shoppers who buy the utilities of these uh, corporations and water companies, are at fault uh, for misusing water because they think that water is not scarce because they see that the rain falls outside their window so much. But with it, across the UK, there's such a great climate variability. In the in the north, increasingly, there's a lot of um, flooding. 
repeated you know year in year out and then in the south um it's you know getting known to be uh full of droughts people are growing grapes for wine because it's you know becoming a bit of a mediterranean now and so what this report really critically and calculatedly leaves out is that corporations um have benefited from the uk government's uh you know a, a systematic deregulation uh, of water policies and that has led to um, the companies not having to report any spillages it's then obliged to by law or by regulation and so it's meant that ag- agricultural waste raw sewage all of these are kind of and also like um, industrial wastes from um, non-agricultural uh, processes are also filling up the water systems in the UK and actually, two weeks after the Great British Rain Paradox was released, um, the, another re- uh, report that came out by ENDS actually stated that all of England's rivers are polluted. And only five days ago, I think there was um, there was a report saying that over half of England's rivers um, are polluted with raw sewage. And so when we, you know, when we swim in this very clear, very uh, <laughs> healthy water within ECHO, we are maybe seeing this, seeing the potential of disaster uh, disguised in this very nice kind of swim journey. But once the processes of industrial um, uh, activities happen uh, later on in the game with uh, the, the, the works and the mills and the mines that are situated among the around the banks of the water um we're going to be you know repeating these processes that we see and and consequences as well um in in the game and so when we think about timelining history you know in 20 years time we can look back and say okay a proportion of the population i.e the the most powerful i.e government states corporations have told their part of history what about ours what about the different uh community-centred knowledges around the UK that haven't quite been documented to the same level um, of, uh, of, I guess, like, to the, to the higher level of platforming, uh, with greater exposure of audiences. And so with the project Brain Paradox that I researched and, and produced, like, how can we encourage these conversations, the daily, everyday um chats and you know living room conversations i'm calling them very casual but super informative um about our local regions about our local um, community actions that are already happening and have long existed in the history of you know um climate actions especially amongst racialized and minoritized populations um in the uk amongst diaspora who have experiences in other areas of the world where water is scarce. You know, you can't just drink the tap water. You don't just have running water um, without the, you know, consequence of having to, yeah, have have really high utility bills, for example. Access is different. And so um, I return to think about how history repeats itself if we're not careful of the narratives that we, show and share and uh, redistribute. So it's important that, you know, with this meteorite that's about to come in, in echo in the game, like how do we make sure that the water is something that um, lasts us long enough for the end of the world? Or at least the end of, you know, <laughs> the existence for other species, even if we diminish as humanity or as you know the game players of um of this world how how can the sharks the fish the plants continue to survive um and i wonder whether i should leave it there in in the interest of time um but you know there are there are surely more things that i would like to to say um if anyone wants to input as well i think it would be a great chance to open up the discussion because you know there's so many overlaps between us and yeah, I feel like I feel like we're climbing back onto shore now, but <laughs> gravity resists. Um, 
Yeah, thank you, Angela. Um, yeah, I think in, indeed it's a good uh, time to maybe open up um, to some question or some more informal um, intervention if some of um, you feel like um, adding to, uh, to the conversation. Hey. Hey. Mm. There's also have access to the. Um, can you repeat, Alison? I was wondering if um, if everyone is getting on now to to have a chat or. Yeah, let's chat. <laughs> yeah, I don't have. I I sort of have to go, but I, I I'm happy to stay for like four more minutes. <laughs> no worries. Um, yeah, if anyone is uh, would like to add anything, then um, speak now. Otherwise, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've, yeah, I've got something. Yeah, okay, I want to mention one thing. Question. Actually, that was oh. Really, oh. Go, ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry, we're all good. Um, okay, Wessing, go for it. Uh, all right. Yeah, mine's kind of basic, so maybe it's a place to start. Um, so you know, obviously, we're in this game for a limited amount of time, and we all live like lives in IRL, and you know, we have stuff to do there. So it's always com kind of competing, um, you know, things for our attention. So our time is a, a scarce resource. So one of the things about this game is like um, somebody described it as kind of a grinding game where you have to like, you have to hustle to like level up, to learn skills, to again, get resources, to build things. So there's kind of this difficulty curve uh, built into the game, uh, which makes it hard to um, achieve objectives make progress inverted commas and i did wonder because you know this is a, a kind of a dedicated server a dedicated planet that we're in is there a way that you know that's available to us as players and, and world builders if as you could say to change the parameters of the world so to, so that we can um uh, realize our kind of you know objective uh, our objectives of progress uh, more readily and easily or is it more that like the playing field is kind of level in all possible worlds and you just have to grind it out and put the time in uh, to get to get where we need to get to um yeah so it's basically the same in in every every server uh, i think the only difference is that uh in in the other server there's people that uh are heavy gamers and that put the amount of time and energy that we have we put somewhere else in the game uh, there is a way where you can cheat and turn everyone into an admin and then you can do basically whatever you want um, so that's the two ways cheating or just having no life basically <laughs> well, that's, that's quite realistic i suppose then <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think um the other way of, because the servers normally can host up to quite a lot of people, so I think 20, 20 people in total is, is quite a small server, and then the amount of people that we are actually in-game in the same time is very, very small for the game. But like I think usually you would have a community that splits up and divide tasks where one person really, or like one community really focuses on the mining aspect, the other one really on the chopping wood aspect, the other one, you have a community for farming and cooking, etc., the division um, of labor, which exactly. is also like a hallmark of more advanced economies. And maybe also you'd split by time, so there'd be like kind of shifts or something like that. I, get, I, I can imagine, yes. Yeah. Mm -mm. I know that there's in this type of uh, open world um, somewhat survival games that like it's very common that like um, that there are kind of uh, ways of dividing and organizing a community that like the more time you've spent in let's say uh, gathering a certain uh, um, uh, base material raw material that that kind of like puts you up higher in rank in the <laughs> in the community let's say so there is uh, oh, that reminds me of um, guilds. So I think in World of Warcraft, I mean Frankie Coitler wrote about this in her Prehistory of DAOs article, where um, there was this kind of meta currency that wasn't even in the game. It was outside the game called Dragon Kill Points, and it was kind of a way of like recording the the guild's progress in these kind of massive meta objectives, and they were kind of rewarded between games or even outside the game, the real world. Yeah, I think that's exactly like uh, like that. Actually, I think it's pretty much uh, 
functioning at the end like a, like a guild. And I think we, I mean, the idea is that we brought in caretakers to simulate a little bit that kind of like multiplayer sort of aspect of the game. But I think ideally we would have like, I don't know, higher, <laughs> like give fees for like two months, you know, so nobody has to work and we just do that nonstop uh, with like, I don't know, yeah, 50 people or something. That would be like, more the scale I think where it could potentially you would achieve the, the goals let's say. This is reminding me of we had a, a session in the Trust Discord um, with Agnes Cam Cameron the other day and she was taking us through the economics of RuneScape uh, you know the old 2007 fork of RuneScape and one of the things that happened in there is because the Venezuelan the real world Venezuelan currency collapsed to, to such an extent that um, there were bots doing jobs in the game and they got replaced by real he people mining virtual gold in the game that used to be done algorithmically. Oh, I, <laughs> I feel like I'm being attacked now. <laughs> <laughs> by a, by a, a leopard. Yeah. Um. Oh, that's, that's great, Rasim. I, yeah, um, I wanted to kind of like jump in and respond or maybe like expanding different ways of thinking about progress because I feel like the landscape or the waterscape of uh, Echo itself is, is kind of really trying to turn us into uh, into people who are more conscientious maybe because I'm thinking that this morning um, in our prep we actually uh, swam downstream and then we realized that at the bottom it, the sea isn't there it's just more of a lake and it doesn't it doesn't go as far as you hope it to go and actually in, in IRL like the all, all of the rivers go into estuaries that go into seas that have a, you know, historically allowed for international trade and colonizations. And here you don't really have that opportunity because of the waterways being almost a dead end. And so when you establish your mines and your, you know, your, your foundries and your whatever's to produce the materials, to produce tools and then other types of products, um, if you were to establish more communities downstream, um, like who would you even kind of like sell them to? Or like, how, if if this game were something that was a bit more replicating real life, like what? How would colonization be kind of? Um, I don't know, like par paralleled in this way, when the water system is is uh, not quite fitting um, how we know it in our real world. So I find that bit quite interesting. Um, so actually, in the world, uh, you can create currency and you can start trading uh, with each other so I think it would be probably interesting to also sort of like stay in a server for like the duration of a month and see sort of like a, a field study of the game like how how is that work what is what is a different dynamic you know maybe the mining person as you Anna say are like more status and therefore is trading was like uh, how do you say, more valuable in a sense, talking about a uh, monetary system that Wasim was talking about. Um, yes, yeah, so I would be interested to see if there is such thing as colonization, like in a sense, because some of the, some of the game players have more reputation and can somehow like uh, invade maybe other, other people's territory or claim responsibility for it or yeah I think that would be interesting to dig into that and see <laughs> sure it was more of a hopeful and maybe <laughs> like a, a hopeful for justice kind of angle that where whereby I'm saying that oh the landscape of the water um doesn't actually take us like from uh the way that you know how the British government and uh industry set up uh, dynamite productions uh, on estuaries. Um, I was looking at one on the Thames estuary that then exported uh, dynamites throughout the empire mm. and then brought back through the waterways the spoils of the empire to Britain to decorate, you know, the the stately homes and such. And so, with this being something that's almost a dead end waterway, hopefully, <laughs> the citizens of Echo uh, or Eco can can. Uh, you know, uh, working with a more just kind of world. Yes. More protected. 
I wonder if there's like a maybe we can think about more of a in, interspecies or ecological lens to colonization, not necessarily like a human on human, and like with the attitude and the uh, interrelations that we have with the other animals and the species in the game. So one of the things I noticed a couple of days ago is, and I, uh, Anna and Elwa has also pointed this out in one of the calls we had, is that uh, to level up in the game, to get the stars you need, to get the skills, to build the stuff and all the rest of it, make progress, um, you have to kind of go, you know, get your bow and arrow out and go kill stuff. Like, the bigger animals, the better. Then you go cook them and eat them so you have a balanced diet. And so really the game is kind of pushing you into kind of extractive um, and uh, kind of carnivorous behavior. Uh, at the expense of uh, your surroundings. You really don't ha seem to have much of a choice in the game if you want to, inverted commas, uh, make progress. But maybe as the game develops, you might be able to imagine different modes of cooperation existence with the environment, with the ecosystem. And I wonder if um, uh, on the screen we could bring up the population levels of the different animals and species in the game, because you can actually track that in the game. So I was literally wandering around this plane, killing stuff, and watching the number of bison go down as I was doing it. Um, no, yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, you can answer. Yeah, I'm having on the on the map uh, on the live stream at, ne at least now, but if Eloise does it on the same time for the Discord. Yeah, you have this quite advanced uh, and precise mapping system that also on the back end you can uh, dive into the server of the game and really see kind of population decline, etc. So these numbers there, <laughs> there's quite like an advanced way of, of displaying your, your environment in that sense. Um, I think something we have been interested in before as well playing this game is that um, there is a, a somewhere a layer, I'm opening it up now, which is a pollution layer, which has to do with player activity and the amount that the player tramples the soil. Because it is quite interesting in this game that um, kind of any interaction you have as a, as a human avatar in your environment is sort of like based on the idea that everything you do is polluting. Um, uh, and indeed there's no kind of like relationship you can have with your environment with animals around you that that could be kind of like more symbiotic or beneficial to both in a way and um, it's so kind one of thing I noticed Anna is like we were trying to exchange some like skill scrolls and I realized I might have um, thrown them away because I run out of space in my inventory and is there a way of getting rid of things that isn't literally just dumping them in the ground like is there a nice way of doing it I couldn't find one uh, not not really like um, at some point like basically any yeah uh, well that for like organic material you can at some point compost them and uh, turn them into fertilizer so there is a kind of uh, some sort of circularity there but anything else um, like at some point when you start uh, har harvest or like uh, chopping iron etc there's a kind of residue left that is uh, spilling pollution as well into the soil and you really have to bury it deep into the ground in order not to pollute your to, uh, your grounds basically so there's no <laughs> uh, although that that part really has a quite advanced system of like breaking down the waste in smaller materials where you can kind of use parts of it as sand again and uh, so in there are some focuses on there in certain fields and in some places they are they are quite absent yeah. You know, I was thinking just now, sorry to interrupt you, but I was just thinking now, because there's that island that you were sw you swam across to that doesn't have anybody on it. It's kind of an unpopulated island. And um, maybe that's where we would dump everything. And then that reminded me once I went to the Maldives in the South Indian Ocean, and uh, they built islands out of trash and they put an airport on it. So yeah. like, may maybe there's something we can do with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's kind of like at some point what we started like doing when we were playing the game during the first lockdown uh, was to use trash as architecture yeah to build like uh, for instance for a windmill you need to have like four earth high so we would just like pile up trash to do that because earth itself is kind of actually valuable because you need it to build dirt ramps so so that's what we started doing and I think that's kind of like potentially a good way forward but like for the for the mining thing, it's too polluting. You really need to bury it, I think, 40, 40 20 blocks down or yeah, something? Yeah, quite deep, yeah. yeah. Mm. Maybe we can build the sea defense with all the pollution and the trash <laughs> for when the tidal wave comes after uh, that. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
to add on to that point though sorry my internet cut out just after i spoke last um in case i i yeah didn't respond to anyone but um adding to that like is there climate variability in the game as well because you mentioned uh to me that you don't actually have to drink water to survive you collect all the food and you have to you know pause and sustain yourself by eating at points but then not having to drink water um as a regular exercise um kind of is strange to me so is water so limited because it doesn't rain here that it's only held in the water bodies that we see um i mean i think it's i think it's a very good point indeed <laughs> because it's quite strange that because it's the most essential Crazy. thing that you kind of need it's the quickest thing that you would run out as a as a, as a physical human body um but um or you can live the shortest without basically um but like uh, there are certain like i think when you get a bit more advanced in cooking you will need sweet water and for certain processes you need sweet water so you kind of get, have to get it from the river uh to your base nice, wherever yeah. that is um so you can you have to construct pipes in order to transport water from one place to another uh, but yeah I it's see, quite sure. yeah but other than that it's quite quite limited the need for water in this yeah. uh, in this game which i think is i absolutely agree it's very strange uh also in relation to other survival game that we've played where water did play a huge role and you really ne needed to collect it and yeah it was rust uh, this uh, survival game rust that we've played before where you really need to drink and find clean water like you you can't drink the sea water uh, there's polluted water around, so you really have to search around for actually uh, uh, potable water. That's how it's called, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, ironically, it would be sometime in old plastic bottles, which are themselves full of like these chemicals. <laughs> I think so. It's kind of interesting. <coughs> that leads me to wonder: what's the best dish that you've prepared in the game? Ooh. Uh, Oh, there is lots of really nice dish. Um, uh, I think the more you advance, the nicer they get. I mean, you can cook tortillas. And At some point, you were really starting to bake cakes also. Yeah. That, then it became quite celebratory and uh, festive. <laughs> a bit, yeah, like, bit of a lockdown trend going on in the game. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Are you okay? I have a follow-up question, which is like, can you survive the game being vegetarian or vegan? Or do you have to be a carnivore? I don't think so. I think you cannot. And that's really a frustration for me because that's also not really reflecting the way food works in real life. Um, you have to kill animals. I think. I mean, we've tried to be vegetarian and that didn't work. Yeah, it's uh, because there is this little, um, uh, yeah, like, Ba uh, nutrition balance counter in the left down corner that sort of monitors how much you're eating from each particular um, uh, uh, nutritional resource and you have to balance it out and meat is quite a, a staple in, 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 in keeping that balanced. So I think the problem is that um, the protein part, so you need to have like right protein, I think fats, carbs and vitamins should be like balance so you should have a quarter like of each basically and um and they didn't think about food like that is not meat that can bring protein so you have beans but they don't mean they don't bring enough protein you have mu mushroom should be a, a source of protein this is not the case here um so that's something that uh, is a uh, is a personal frustration, at least for me. I wonder if the developers are uh, carnivores. Maybe that's how we got yeah, here. Maybe. I, I assume so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because that's something in Rust you could totally go by without eating meat, and here it's not the case, yeah. Yeah. Also, you never have to go to the toilet. Yeah, I was about to say that because at one point you told me I should build a toilet in my house so I could level up faster. And then I was like, wait a minute, I have a toilet? I, don't, I haven't seen a toilet in the game. 
Yeah, you, you, you construct a toilet, but you never have to use it, which again is, I think, a bit of a shame because that could sort of add into the fertilizer uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. component. So actually, one of, the things, one of the things I was um, thinking about mentioning uh, when I was talking earlier that I, did, I didn't come round to is this concept from uh, Jason W. Moore of uh, cheap nature. Yeah. Now one, I, I guess a lot of you have come across this idea, and the game seems to feel like we are treating nature in that way. Like it's just yeah. kind of a thing that we extract from and we just dump our kind of waste and our unwanted stuff onto. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very good, uh, that's a very good example. Um, and I think also I would say there is something about, and I mean, of course I understand it's a video game, and, but there is something about the, f the way the resource, even the resource that you're supposed to collect or forage are presented to you as... Um, so defined in a sense, like you will never walk in a forest where you just like have a freestanding bush of like berries that way, or you will never go around and be like, oh, here is like scramble iron ore that I can just go and shuffle around. So I think what it's it does, also, sorry, yeah. Sorry, I was gonna inject and say, it's also self-identifying for you, pick me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's exactly that's exactly the, 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 the point I think where it connects with this idea with, uh, with uh, cheap nature and it kind of push you to pick up basically. It's really hard not to do it. Uh, it feels very rewarding to extract in this game. Um, kill me, kill me, extract from me, extract from me. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's like a nature demanding to be like... <laughs> yeah, and um, it w this is something that we have been a bit frustrated as well because in the first lockdown when we have been playing this a bit too much, we had uh, a really beautiful farm. Uh, we were really focusing on a quite nice farm land, but there's no way of kind of introducing any sort of permacultural uh, way of, of, of uh, doing agriculture. And it really kind of like, uh, gear, like forces you to go towards this sort of uh, industrialized farming where you ha at some point get a tractor where it becomes just a lot easier to make a square of tomatoes and, and, and uh, mice and uh, wheat and you can basically drive through with your vehicle and that's it and um, there's no benefit from having uh, let's say the, the three sisters of having like uh, a pumpkin next to corn uh, next to beans that then there you get a lot more harvest from them for example and <laughs> yeah i wonder if that would be possible to do such a game that would be so nice the yeah. uh, permaculture simulator yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's, a, it's another game that we have been looking at a little bit, Farming Simulator, um, where you, which is basically kind of simulating, like driving around with large vehicles and, and doing mass agriculture, basically. And in the, in the chat groups uh, around that game, like when, when you want to purchase the game, for example, there's a quite uh, heated discussion between m more like permaculture-oriented uh, uh, people and the, the mass agriculture fans that are like, this is really the best way of farming. And then the permaculture is like, oh, it's a shame that it's only with pesticides and stuff like that and these big machines. And <laughs> it's a it's a very nice conversation to be reading this this argument under a farming simulator game. Um, I wonder if there's something structural as well, because like one of the things we haven't maybe discussed as much is like the game is running on infrastructure, right? Cloud servers and they mm -hmm. you know sit in data centers. That takes carbon dioxide and all the rest so like that's kind of the bedrock on which the gaming industry especially the kind of online gaming industry is built and mm -hmm. so maybe we see mass agriculture as the logical kind of solution because it reproduces that infrastructural uh, motif yeah absolutely i think that's uh that's really uh one of the that, that paradigm it's really hard to get to extract yourself from this kind of thinking when the whole infrastructure is anyway build on that regardless of what google says or amazon says uh. yeah and I, I think also within this game it doesn't really uh, um, allow you to from the start uh, try to experiment things in different ways like, uh, uh, there are certain machines that um, in the beginning you can run them on on wind energy but then quite quickly you have to go really into the polluting versions of it and you can never really stick to wind energy and just kind of like upscale that in order to maintain 
even just a small amount of, of equipment, let's say. So it, it, it immediately forces you to go for the coal or the oil option, even if you do actually would never want to use it. Um, so you can't go low tech, you can't go solar pump, you have to go exactly, of, like, yeah. active. Exactly. And I think that's why, uh, I mean, she's n not here, but when we discussed with uh, Steph, one of the caretakers, she was saying maybe we should just give up and not get into, not try even to save the planet. And I think that's kind of a valid answer because there is no, it doesn't provide you with um, an alternative timeline, like as Angela was saying, like not repeating his story. It's, it's, it's not speculative in that way, which I think is a pity because it could be, uh, it could be trying to find like a way where history doesn't repeat itself, but it's really not based on like the way we understand progress uh, in the West, uh, basically. I, I would play eco nihilism, eco nihilism simulator. I would play that game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, count me in. <laughs> <laughs> but on the side note, I think that might be a slight charm of playing this game with a smaller community is that, um, yeah, we have a quite a nice small wooden base in the center for <laughs> for everyone, and I think there's a a charm to also the kind of inability of a of a small group of people of, of maybe not being able anyway to reach these uh, <laughs> these very polluting systems, and yeah, uh, we exactly. just don't have the, the the power for it, and uh, and that the infrastructure is is not there also yeah. for us to think about it otherwise, and that's also quite similar to. <sighs> the real world, if I can say that, in the sense that as a consumer, the infrastructure is not there or really hard to access to think or do things differently. And anyway, that wouldn't matter, even if it would. So here it's quite similar in a sense to how it maybe we can be like Maybe we can be like those last few uncontacted tribes on those the little islands or in the Amazon. Like, can we just like, somebody else comes to our server and we reject their advanced <laughs> technologies. <laughs> Which is like, no, we don't care. <laughs> How would they get onto our globe, though? Because we've traversed our whole globe as like the small community we have. So they would have to maybe come on the meteorites that's coming. <laughs> exactly. We're, well, this, we're waiting uh, patiently on an alien civilization enter this, yeah, uh, this world. This is like um, the theory of directed pan of panspermia that mushroom spores carried life from planet to planet, yeah. possibly through meteors. Yeah, yeah. I'm down for that. Yeah. yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds tasty. <laughs> um, okay. Ooh. Yeah, Angela shared some picture of uh, our beans on the, on the Discord channel. Sorry, uh, audience, you cannot see this. Um, okay. Maybe that's a good place to leave it. Yeah. Hoping for another mycelial civilization to come to our world. <laughs> and um, we have another event on the 23rd of October, same time, uh, 3 o'clock Athens time, um, with uh, Lola Olufemi, Xenia Chagamonte, and Laura Ottebeke. Um, and on the 25th, I think it's the end of the world. Uh, the meteorite will strike. So we are going to try to see if we can organize an informal live stream of the end of the world. Uh, but we'll keep you posted with that. Yeah. So again, if you would like to join uh, in-game at some point, reach out, send us a message or uh, email events at athensbiennial.org in order to get a login uh, to the game. Yes. Um, thank you very much for joining in and uh, see you next time.